and successful login returns the account ID by the looks of things. All right. Well, now we're in a position to try a bit of SQL injection. Blank password. And it happens to work. So this only works because the validation, the input validation of, uh, of these values is being done on the client and not on the server side. So this is a misarchitecture of the application. All this security components, the input validation and so on, this really must be implemented on the server side and not like it's done here on the client. So while we're doing this, we may as well do something like uh, brute force usernames. This is bean shell scripting, reading a number of uh, passwords from a dictionary. No, a number of usernames from a, a dictionary file. Right, this is all pretty familiar Java stuff. Try and log in using our SQL injection with the given username. If it succeeds, add it to an array. And pretty easy to call uh, scripts that you've written with the bean shell, like so. And it will run through the script and find the examples. Yeah. So, t sorry, actually, can we wait till the end? Because I'm, I'm running tight in time. Thanks. Uh, okay, and then of course the the key that we wanted to test was access control. Can Bob view Alice's orders, right? So if we look at the GUI, Bob can view 001, 007. He can't view 002. So that's the first thing we'll try here is O equals. Now the reason I know this is because we can see the methods on this uh, interface here, so we know what we're going to call get order with an integer, right? So we're just going to try different integers. So pretty simple, ejb dot get order one zero zero two. Okay, there is an object there, and we can inspect the fields on that order class. Build to first name. Belongs to Alice. Right. So again, a misarchitecture of the application. The state is being stored on the client side, and just because the GUI is in the way, there's a false sense of security that um, you can't actually view other people's orders. But on the server side, if you can call those methods directly, you can view those orders. Right. Now, once you've explored the application with um, with the bean shell, perhaps what you want to do is override or overwrite methods completely with uh, aspect J. And this means that you, that you will permanently change this jar file to to behave as you want. And I'll be using a new type of advice here called around advice. Now, around advice is different to before or after in that you can optionally choose to ignore the original method. So if you wanted to, you can run something, uh, you can run some around advice which executes before. It then calls the original method and then executes something after. Or you can just overwrite the, uh, the method completely. So going back to that login functionality, this was the trace of what happens during login, right? This was using uh, aspect J to do the tracing. And this is what came out. Client form dot login calls the server side login. It then sets the account ID. It does a comparison and then it exits and returns a boolean, right? So if we wanted to rewrite this method, what we could do is just ignore the server side, <coughs> set the account ID directly, and then just return J. 
true at the end, okay? And that's what we can do here with aspect J. this code for now. So we define the point cut. The point cut is going to match exactly our client form dot login uh, method with two strings as an argument. Conceptually all we want to do is form dot account ID is the account ID and then return true. But we can't do that because account ID is a private field. So all this code is really just to use reflection to get a hold of the class, to get a hold of the field, turn accessibility to true again so that we can access private fields and then set the value on the field. Just a longhand version of, of doing this effectively. Okay. So we apply that advice. Oops. Done. Advice applied. We now run with the advice. And now we've patched the login method. Doesn't matter who we log in as. It's going to log us in as Bob because we've set the account ID manually to Bob's ID. And we can view Bob's orders. Right. Just to give you an idea of what you can do with Aspect J from this a practical point of view, it was a bit pointless because we had to know Bob's account ID in the first place, right? So if we wanted to test something like the access control, if we wanted to test whether, um, if, whether Bob can view Alice's orders, what we really wanted to do is to be able to set that list box and insert the order numbers into that list box. And we can do that too. So we define a new point cut. Uh, let me just show you what that trace looks like to refresh your memory. Populate order list. This is the method that was populating the order list, right? So it called the server side, get order IDs that returned a list. It converted the list to an array and then it set list data using that array and that was the end of it. So we can do the same thing, we just won't call the server side, we'll just create our own array. Right? And that's what this code does. Again, I have to use reflection because order list box is a private field on form, so we can't access it normally. So have to use reflection, have to turn accessibility to true, and then eventually we can access it. So I create my own array here, 1001, 1002, 1003. That should belong to Alice. These two should belong to Alice, right? Login needs to be a lot, whole lot simpler. We just need to return true. Since we're not using the account ID, we just needed to log us into the GUI, right? Actually, it doesn't matter who we log in as, right? it returns the orders that we placed in it. So we've permanently patched the application to behave as we like um, by using aspect J. So basically, um, what I've demonstrated is that you can do, you have a lot of power using simple open source developer tools. You don't need to understand the bytecode and you can override and overwrite um, client-side Java code. You can trace application flow using uh, Aspect J and Eclipse TPTP. Um, you can get UML2 diagrams right out of Eclipse TPTP to try and understand execution flow. 
And then you can manipulate the, uh, the, the, the final client either permanently using aspect J or insert a bean shell, or insert a JOI, so that you can play around interactively and find out what's going on inside that application. I want to close with uh, a mention of Arshan's talk, uh, which is happening in the Neapolitan room in just a few minutes. Now, I didn't mention Java Snoop because it hasn't been released yet. It will be released in a few minutes. And it's really a GUI that makes a lot of the bean shell, um, well, the functionality that I took out of the bean shell, you will get with Java Snoop. It's, a, it's an easy to use GUI application. You don't need to inject anything. It will automatically let you select from a list of Java, running Java processes, select the process, and you can then intercept method calls, you can set fields, you can do all sorts of fancy stuff with it. So recommend you uh, attend this talk if you're interested in, in the subject. Yes, there were questions. Sorry? I haven't tried it, but I mean that's that's certain. Oh yes, sorry. The question was: um, Have you tried uh, remote command execution on the server side? Right. Do, you would be stuck in the JVM. But for example, if you wanted to exploit a bug in the JVM on the server side, you could try and do that from the client. It all depends on how the transport, what the transport does to your uh, your exploit, as it were, or your your payload. You know, if it if it mangles it or if it doesn't work properly. But certainly that's, that's conceivable. I mean, once you have the remote interface, you can call whatever you want on the server side. If I could run the server side, if I could run the server and do this stuff, does this stuff work well on the server side as well? Like, can it, if you've got a big server with a lot of code. Yeah, yeah. Kind of yeah, sure. If, if, as long as it's, oh, sorry. Sorry, the question was, uh, can you run this on the server side? So for example, can you inject the bean shell on the server side? Or can you inject the JOI on the server side? You certainly can, yeah. I guess if it's a GUI tool, it would, but if the bean shell won't, because you know it doesn't need to keep anything in context. So you can have a scripting environment inside your server-side code, and I think that's probably the, le the legitimate use of the bean shell. Uh, what developers normally use it for is to do that kind of thing. All right. Any more? Yes. I really should, shouldn't I? Yes. Um, <laughs> have a look on uh, Corsair's site, www.corsair.com. I'll, I'll post them there shortly. So All right. Both, uh, yeah. And also the example application, if you want to run that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Thank you very much.